Alright. Okay. We're going to start taking a look here at now regulate translation. We discussed in the past about translation, the process itself, the initiation, the elongation, termination. By the way, that's a common test question. Is something like draw or describe the elongation cycle or describe what happens during initiation, something like that. That that. So you just choose usually just choose one, not all yeah, three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I usually put quite frequently historically it's been elongation, but that's not always a guarantee. I can throw a curveball and do. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. but know the whole process, okay? <laughs> you never know what I'm going to hit you with until it's too late. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's take a look at regulation. Okay, once again, when we look at eukaryotes, and this is not the case for prokaryotes, prokaryotes regulate their gene expression by transcription. You turn the gene on, you turn the gene off. And it's pretty much end of story. But eukaryotes, because we're dealing with multicellular organisms, we're dealing with having to express certain genes in certain cell types and express other genes in other cell types, all that stuff you need for differentiation. Well, we are going to have much more fine-tuned control of gene expression. Well, I already mentioned all the kind of stuff about regulating at the level of transcription, in other words, the RNA synthesis. Uh, we mentioned about RNA processing, alternate splicing, deciding whether or not to splice a particular RNA, things like that. Finally getting the stuff out in the cytoplasm. And yet we have that third level of regulation of gene expression. And that's the level of translation itself, of protein synthesis. We can do a number of things about that. And many of these things involve proteins binding to the poly A tail, the 3' untranslated region, and sometimes perhaps the 5' untranslated region. That 5' region is pretty short, but in the 3' region is quite large. It's interesting, once again, the 3' UTR gets bigger than general trend. It's the large, larger for more complex organisms. So a little flatworm or something isn't going to have too many really long ones, but a vertebrate will. Okay, so that means more opportunities to bind regulatory proteins. So we can look at this in several different ways of how we regulate translation, and then we'll take a peek at some of the aspects and give some examples here. Okay, one thing. our lifespan of a messenger RNA in the cytoplasm. Once it goes out, let's face it, if you're an RNA, it's a dangerous neighborhood. The cytoplasm is a dangerous neighborhood because it's full of all kinds of nucleases. And these nucleases are hiding in the corners, waiting to jump out and attack you. All right, so like some neighborhoods in Birmingham, right? <laughs> you know, you walk down the street in the middle of the night, man. You don't know what's going to happen to you, but any rate, <laughs> or answer that, it's a pretty nice place there. Okay, it's a bad neighbor. It's a dangerous neighborhood if you're an RNA. Because of all these nucleases, and there's all kinds of different RNA digesting nucleases in the cytoplasm. So, a given RNA, the lifespan can vary dramatically. And they usually refer to this as the half-life. In other words, how long does it take for half of a population of particular RNAs to disappear? That can vary dramatically. On the low end, it could be as little as, say, about 10 minutes. And the high end, it could be many hours or even longer. Now, if you happen to be, let's, let's think of this. If you happen to be a messenger RNA, with a very short half-life, you go in the cytoplasm, you're only going to be around for about 10 minutes or so. Likely, you're only going to get translated a few times. So, that one RNA molecule may ultimately lead to the production of, say, 10 protein molecules. 
Okay. Now, if you happen to be a long-lived RNA, you could be translated thousands of times. So that one RNA molecule may ultimately lead to the production of a thousand or even ten thousand copies of a particular protein. Now, the other thing. If you are a short-lived RNA, what it means is you're produced, you're translated, you're dead. And what it means is that for the cell to regulate gene expression, what you're going to have to do is rely mostly on transcriptional regulation. In other words, a few, not long after, probably when you take the processing all that into account, probably less than an hour after you stop transcribing that gene, there are no more messenger RNAs of that type in the cytoplasm. And if you want more of those messenger RNAs, you've got to switch that transcription of that gene on again. So in this case, you're leaning on transcriptional regulation real heavy. So I'm going to say mostly transcription. Okay, now over here with the long-lived RNAs, you transcribe a gene, you have these stable RNAs, they go out in the cytoplasm, they're still going to be used and translated into protein long after you shut that gene off. You can turn that gene on for 10 minutes and make a few dozen copies of that messenger RNA, and they're going to be like the Energizer Bunny. They keep going and going and going when they're in the cytoplasm. So in this case, you're going to probably need to regulate mostly at the level of translation. Okay, so messenger RNA is very dramatically in stability. And when you talk about the number of protein molecules that can be produced from each messenger RNA, you're talking about roughly a thousand-fold difference. Okay, so that's, obviously, that makes a tremendous impact on gene expression. Just how long does that messenger RNA survive in the cytoplasm? Okay, now we come up with the dirty question. How is this controlled? Well, what appears to control it are proteins, and we don't know exactly how these guys work. But what appears to control it are proteins that associate with the poly A tail and or the 3' untranslated region. Okay, and we can do a little, few little experiment, a little bit of experimental evidence in this type. Okay, let's take messenger RNAs out of a cell. And we're going to put them in the S <coughs> tube and we're going to do something to them. We're going to add enzymes that destroy the poly A tail. Now, we take those RNAs and put them back into the cell and ask what happens to them. In other words, we remove the poly A tails and put these guys back in. Of course, we do a control experiment. We just take the phase out and put them back in. Uh, What we find when we do this poly A tail removal trick is that the population, the half-lives of those messenger RNAs drops tremendously. And another side effect is even is the efficiency of translation, specifically the initiation of translation, drops about 90%. So if you remove the poly A tails, not only are those messenger RNAs not going to live very long, but they're also not as efficient at promoting initiation as ones with poly A tails. So we remove the poly A tails, the lifespan lunges. All right. Now, a little bit for the future. It turns out inside cells, in the cytoplasm, there are both enzymes that can chew up the poly A tail, or partially chew it 
thereby shortening its lifespan. And there are other enzymes, there are cytoplasmic poly-A polymerases. These are the enzymes that add poly -A tails. So in the cytoplasm, we can expand or shrink the poly -A tails at will. Or shrinks the cells. Yeah, uh -huh. there's enzymes that can do that in the cytoplasm. So we have poly A polymerases, cytoplasmic versions, and we have the poly A, whatever, nuclease, the ones that chew it up. So we can expand or shrink them. That actually happens in some cases. We'll see some of that later on. So that's one little experiment. Second little experiment related to this. Some folks did a neat little genetic engineering trick. They got the sequence for two genes. In one gene, the messenger RNA happened to be a very stable one. It stayed in the cytoplasm for, for a long, long time. The second gene had a very unstable messenger RNA. It only lasted a matter of minutes in the cytoplasm. So what they did with genetic engineering tricks is they took these genes and they cut the sequences of the, of the three prime untranslate region from one gene and switched it. So they took, and let's put this down. So they took the three prime untranslated region. They took that from a long-lived RNA and they spliced it into and replaced the sequence of a short-lived RNA. And then they took the short-lived sequence, short-lived 3' prime UTR, and put that in front of what's normally a long-lived RNA. And then they asked the question, when we switched short and long-lived 3' prime UTRs, what happened to those modified RNAs? Well, the answer was this. The formerly long-lived messenger RNA that now has the 3' UTR from the short-lived one, lo and behold, it had a short life too. Its half-life plunged tremendously down to about the level of the short-lived one. When they took the short, uh, when they took the long-lived UTR and put it from the short and put it behind the short-lived messenger RNA, lo and behold, the lifespan of that messenger RNA increased dramatically. So what this is telling us is that the 3' UTR plays an important role in regulating lifespan. It's not just the poly A tail, it's the untranslated regions as well. Both of them play important roles. Okay, so that's one big way of regulating translation. It's just the lifespan of the messenger RNA. And that is dependent on proteins binding to the poly A tail and the 3' UTR. Okay, now second thing we can do. we can do is bind proteins. Here again, these proteins are, what are mostly going to be the proteins that bind to the poly A tail or the 3' UTR, perhaps especially the poly A tail. We can bind proteins that will either promote the initiation of translation or will inhibit it. Now, that was first night of this, that, that, that was shown by Knowing, noticing that when you remove poly A tails from an RNA, the translation rate dropped 90%. This had nothing to do with the lifespan. You could do this stuff in a test tube. And translation was strongly inhibited just by removing the poly A tails from these guys. 
Okay, now kind of a model for this, how does this process work? Well, let's suppose we have a messenger RNA here. I'll put the AEG here. And here's the stop. Uh, okay, I can't just stop code. <laughs> okay, well, ordinarily what you're going to have to have, you have your cap binding protein. And you have to have your small subunit over around here, and then the large subunit comes in the tRNAs, all this kind of fun stuff. All right, now, apparently what seems to happen, these nucleotide, these nucleic acids are fairly long molecules, and nucleic acids are flexible on a long scale, so they can bend around. Remember when you had this thing about DNA from, say, distant part, well away from a gene, could loop around, binding some transcription factors, and these could loop around and then bind to the basal complex. That can happen. We have the same kind of thing. Apparently, you can do, here's our poly A tail. Oh, God, that's terrible A's. Here's our poly A tail. Apparently, you can have proteins binding to this that are actually going to block steps of initiation. Or you can have proteins binding to it that would promote various things like initiation factors, binding, and stuff like that. So this thing can loop around and it can interact with this initiation complex, or pre-initiation complex, they call it, and either promote its assembly or stabilize it or block it. In a sense, this is similar to what we're seeing with terms of with transcription factors and the basal complex of transcription. We're seeing a similar type of principle here, that proteins binding fairly far away from where the initiation complex actually assembles, can interact with it, stabilize it, or disrupt it. So we're seeing this kind of principle once again. Yes? So the poly tail like, binds to the proteins, or does it just bind Yeah, to yeah. The poly tail will bind proteins, and these proteins can then interact with the forming initiation complex. So the proteins are not already there, like the poly yeah, well, um, don't forget, RNAs, in the, whether it's in the nucleus or cytoplasm, are always going to have certain proteins associated with them. They, there are some common proteins that all messenger RNAs have, and then there are sequence-specific proteins you find in certain messenger RNAs and not in others. And these, these can also be replaced. These proteins can be regulated. So you could say you got one protein binding here, you could phosphorylate. It drops off, and then something else comes in, binds the same area and does something different. So you can regulate things by just playing around with these, with these different proteins. Okay, so that's one kind, that's another kind of thing. We can inhibit or enhance translation. And this is especially at the process of initiation. Another thing we can do is what's often called sequestering. Ah, questions? She has a contact. It's not like you want to be to really spook up people. Put a red contact in one eye and maybe another. Or a red one in another. I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> a little funny side of this. Uh, uh, um, one time we had a conference, the Association for Southeastern Biologists was at Birmingham, and JSU was the co-host of the JSU and UAB were co-hosts and stuff. So Dr. Mean comes up, our president comes up there, and he gives us up at the podium. I'm taking a bunch of pictures and stuff for, you know, uh, for ASB, included in their uh, little journal and, and what have you. I had this one picture I took of Mean. He got, you know, the red eye flash reflection. So here he's up there, and his eyes are just this glowing, demonic red in color. <laughs> so I emailed him. Well, I corrected it. I, I, I corrected the red eye before I actually sent it off to ASB. But I sent him the original one. And I, 
<coughs> he said something like possessed by the spirit of biology. He, we used to be in our biology department before he went into administration. He liked that one. And then I sure then I said I got rid of the red eye before he sent that shot off to ESP. I did a lot of processing on it. But at any rate, okay. <laughs> so um, this idea of sequestering is this. A messenger RNA is not going to be translated if the ribosomes can't get to it. And the way you can do this is you can buy the messenger RNA to parts of the cytoskeleton, move them to places ribosomes simply can't get to. And that's going to involve proteins on the 3' UTR and possibly on the poly A tail that play roles in this, in cytoskeletal association. Okay, now, for instance, just beneath the surface of the cell, what we sometimes call the cell cortex, the tenth of a micrometer or so beneath the cell membrane, beneath the outer cell membrane, you have a whole very dense network of active microfilaments just beneath the membrane. It's such a dense network that organelles and things like that simply can't get into it. It's like a bramble bush. Same thing with ribosomes. If you've got messenger RNAs over here, the ribosomes simply can't get to it. Later on, you can release those messenger RNAs, and they will go into the deeper cytoplasm, and then they can get translated. So you can put messenger RNAs in places that the ribosomes simply can't find. Now, another thing we can do We can send the messenger RNA out into the cytoplasm with the 5' cap not fully completed. In other words, we send it out with an ordinary flipped over guanosine rather than the 7 methyl guanosine. Now, that partial cap still gets recognized by the nucleic proteins that get things out of the nucleus. But, Ribosomes cannot, or rather the cap binding protein will not recognize an ordinary guanosine. It has to, re it has to have that 7 methyl guanosine. So now we have this RNA in the cytoplasm with an incomplete cap. The ribosomes simply don't know it's there. They will not recognize it. You can keep it in that state forever. And then later on we can have enzymes that will covalently attach the methyl group to the guanosine restoring the cap, and now the ribosomes recognize it. So for a while it's invisible to the ribosomes, and then we finish the cap, and it pops into existence, and oh, there's a messenger RNA I can translate. So that's another kind of trick we can do. Send it out into the cytoplasm without a complete 5' cap. All right, these are some of the basic types of mechanisms. Now, there's one other thing, it's called RNA interference that regulates translation. We're going to deal with that totally separately. We may, uh, either Tuesday or maybe we'll start on it today, I'm not quite sure, but we're going to look at that. that we will leave that for a future day, a near term for a future day. Okay, so these are four of the major kinds of mechanisms that can regulate translation. Now, let's take a look and see some examples of translational regulation. A couple other points about this. Important point here. Most, if not all, of these proteins that bind to things like the 5' the 3' untranslated region, the poly A tail, and the like. Those proteins themselves can be regulated. Maybe phosphorylation, maybe some kind of binding to an ion, or whatever the case is. So, you can have under some circumstances, this protein binds to the messenger RNA, and then we phosphorylate it, and it pops off. And then something else could come in and bind to that. And that might have a different thing. So we could have, for instance, a translation inhibitor binding to the messenger RNA, and then we 
modify, we regulate that protein, it pops off and on comes a translation activator. So we can regulate these guys. In addition to the ribosomes and stuff, we need a whole battery of translation factors. These are the proteins that are going to be coming in temporarily associating with the ribosome, messenger RNA, tRNA complex, and doing something and then leaving. They're not actually part of the ribosome. We describe a few. We describe that termination factor that acts like a fake tRNA and binds stop codons. We describe the cap binding protein. That's an initiation factor. And there are numerous other kinds of initiation, elongation, and termination factors that play critical roles in this process. In fact, without these translation factors, nothing happens. Okay, now, these can be regulated too. We could turn them on or turn them off. So you can be out in the cytoplasm, messenger RNA, ribosome, you get all your ducts in a row, and if you don't have active translation factors, or at least specific active translation factors, nothing's going to happen. Now that could be controlled either by simply the production or by the regulation. So in other words, if the cytoplasm simply has a very small amount of translation factors, translation is going to go down overall. On the other, or if the cytoplasm has a whole bunch of translation factors, but they're regulated now so that they're switched off, translation is not going to occur. So that's another way of dealing with translation, regulation at the level of translation. So we have all kinds of different things that can play various roles in this process. So clearly we have a lot of diverse opportunities to regulate translation. Okay, we're going to continue on in a moment.